and uh, present uh, the work of the last years with my collaborators. So if I can uh, now share the uh, screen. Ah, I, sh I, should, uh, I should make you just a moment. I should make you co-host just a moment. In a minute, I learned this, so okay. <laughs> okay. Now you are okay. Okay. Okay, I hope you see my screen and now, <laughs> do you see yes. it? Yes. Okay. So today I will talk about beneficial role of randomness starting from physics uh, to social systems. Okay, uh, as uh, you know, I come from Catania, Sicily, and uh, I belong to several institutions. Um, okay, uh, so I'm a theoretical physicist and I work in complex systems, but since 2009, I've been investigating the beneficial role of noise and random strategies in various fields. Uh, starting uh, um, from physics, uh, then I applied it to, to different fields. Why should one adopt random strategies, you may ask? Uh, it may seem irrational, not very scientific, uh, but I'll try to convince you that this is not the case. Um, and uh, this is a short summary. I will not probably be able to touch uh, everything completely, but uh, I'll tell something about all these applications that we have made in these years, starting from 2009. Okay, so I would like to start uh, with this citation, uh, uh, which is a very old one. Uh, it's uh, up to Herodotus, an historian, uh, who said that uh, Persians uh, were very strange people because they used it to discuss their most important matters when they were drunk. Any decision taken was proposed again the next day uh, when they were sober, and if they approved it again, this was totally confirmed. This is just <laughs> a kind of Monte Carlo application of what I will talk today, but it's a very, very old one. So that's, uh, that's just the starting point. We discovered all things, always all things. So you know very well that random numbers are uh, very much used in physics and mathematics for calculating complex integrals. And the Monte Carlo method was invented just by two mathematicians, Ulam and Metropolis in Los Alamos uh, during the Manhattan Project, uh, just during the war. And uh, it today is applied everywhere. So random numbers are really very, very useful in physics and in science in general. Uh, what's okay, but uh, <clears throat> there are also other applications. And for example, I like to quote this uh, uh, other phenomenon, which is based on uh, stochasticity, which is uh, stochastic resonance, which was first discovered and applied for climate change by the group of uh, Giorgio Paris in Rome many years ago in the 80s. And um, <clears throat> and which has a lot of uh, interesting applications. And, uh, and it works like that. Uh, you have a periodic signal uh, and a bistable system. And in order to get a periodic uh, bouncing of the, of the ball, you apply a, you know, um, just a small noise, a stochastic noise. And in this way, with a spatial frequency, which you tune, you may get uh, a, a very nice uh, uh, stochastic phenomenon, which is uh, called stochastic resonance uh, and the periodic oscillation. Uh, there are many applications of, of this stochastic resonance. So you may see, for example, this review on, by Gamaitoni and et al. in reviews of modern physics in 1998. Um, <clears throat> Uh, this is probably very familiar to everybody. When you have a problem with a key, what you do? You usually move it randomly, and uh, if you're lucky, you, you get in. I mean, it works. So, I mean, uh, random noise can be really, really very useful uh, also in uh, daily life. So, um, then we inspired by all these uh, examples, 
uh, we uh, applied uh, um, similar strategies to social sciences. And uh, the first example is this one uh, applied to the Peter Principle. Uh, we have published several papers so with uh, the colleagues Pluchino and Garofalo mm. some years ago. Uh, this is the first one published in 2010. The Peter Principle revisited the computational study in Physica A. Okay, so the problem is this one. Uh, when you have a hierarchical organization and you have a vacancy, who should you promote to increase the efficiency of your organization? Uh, the common answer is that uh, you promote someone from the lower level and probably the best one, okay? <clears throat> because uh, if someone is competent at one level, uh, you may think that it will also probably competent at uh, also the higher level, okay? <clears throat> but uh, is this always valid? Suppose that uh, you have uh, a uh, soccer team and uh, you have a problem with your forward player and your best player is uh, uh, is the goalkeeper would you substitute your uh, uh, forward player with a uh, goalkeeper no of course because everyone has his own task and is very good at that task so that's the problem uh, uh, in fact this was discovered by peter lawrence peter which was a Canadian educator and psychologist in the 60s. <clears throat> and he wrote a very nice uh, book, The Peter Principle after his name, Why Things Always Go Wrong. Because when you apply this philosophy that you promote the best from the lower level, what you get most probably is uh, someone who uh, uh, is not the best at the higher level. I'll try to explain what this means. <clears throat> Uh, we start interested, being interested in this because uh, this book was uh, was a success in the 60s, but then it was forgotten and it was reprinted uh, in 2008 in Italian. And so we, by chance, uh, got to the library and got this book and uh, we start playing with this uh, phenomenon. Uh, okay, so the printer principle is this one. Uh, uh, it apparently is a paradoxical. Sorry. <clears throat> Every new member in a hierarchical organization clumps the hierarchy until he or she reaches his or her level or incompetence. So it means that you get promoted because you are the best. You may be continue to be promoted because you are still the best, but at a certain time, then you stop and uh, you remain there because you are. Uh, already at the top of the hierarchy, so no one can fire you. So, and this means that uh, <clears throat> the incompetence rise uh, towards the top of the hierarchy. And, um, and, uh, and so this, uh, it's a big problem for a hierarchical organization. There is also a corollary that uh, in time, every post tends to be occupied by an employee who is incompetent. And, uh, and uh, the work is accomplished by those employees who are below you, below these, these people. So this means that uh, this could be a problem for real organization. And in fact, uh, he discovered this just by uh, studying uh, uh, empirical hierarchical organization. So is that real? Uh, well, everyone, I think, has uh, his example, a smart researcher who is not able to be a brilliant teacher or a good administrator, a good worker who is not able to be an efficient manager, a good soldier who is not able to be a good commander, and so on and so forth. But uh, this is not a proof, of course. So being physicists, uh, we wanted to, to study in detail this and uh, see if the, we can if this is, is really true, if we can uh, bypass this problem and solve it. Okay, so we uh, imagined that model, a very simple one with uh, some agents that uh, uh, were uh, in different levels of a hierarchical organization. Uh, these uh, um, agents uh, uh, could age, so at a certain, they started to work uh, at 18 and uh, they were uh, um, they retired at 60 <clears throat> and, uh, and they had different uh, level of uh, competence and, um, and occupied these different levels. Uh, when uh, one had uh, a vacancy, you had to promote uh, someone to that, to that um, 
place. Okay, so the, the age uh, uh, was, uh, of course, distributed uh, in, a, in a random way with a Gaussian and also the competence. <clears throat> the different colors just uh, uh, describe these different levels of competence. And each level has a responsibility, which is different. Of course, the top uh, uh, level has the, the greater responsibility. Okay, so we run this uh, very simple model with six hierarchical levels. And uh, under two different hypotheses. The first one is the common sense, the one I explained before, that the agent keeps the same competence when he's promoted to a higher level with a small, uh, just a random uh, error. The second uh, hypothesis is that one of Peter, that uh, he does not keep the same competence because the task is different when he's promoted to higher level. And so you uh, give him again, uh, in a random way, a new competence, okay? <clears throat> so uh, the first result of this simulation was that actually Peter was right. Uh, uh, when, uh, for example, in the Peter hypothesis, that, uh, that means that you uh, give uh, um, uh, the, the agent, uh, reach uh, actually the, the top of, of his uh, um, career before retiring uh, with a competence which is the lowest in his uh, career, okay, under the Peter, uh, under the Peter hypothesis. <clears throat> and this is true for every level of careers, for a three level careers, for a four level careers, five or six. So each time, uh, before retiring, he has the lowest competence for that level. And, uh, but uh, one should define a kind of efficiency in order to, to study how one can uh, have this efficiency of your organization changes uh, with these promotions. So uh, we imagine it to, to define uh, a global efficiency in, in this way that uh, multiplying the competence, uh, uh, capital C, for uh, uh, that level, which is the <clears throat> with the responsibility and uh, just normalizing to the maximum, we could uh, uh, calculate this efficiency for uh, the uh, whole organization and see how it changes in time with the different promotion. So uh, this is a small video that now I will start and I will show you that uh, uh, at the beginning, <clears throat> Let me stop for a moment. We have a, a common sense uh, hypothesis. That is, I promote uh, so the, the, the agent maintain his competence, okay? And uh, in, you promote the most competent, okay? If you are sure that uh, um, the most competent uh, remain competent, this is the best strategy. And in fact, the, uh, the efficiency rise in this case, okay? So let me continue. But now something changes and uh, we change the, uh, the hypothesis and we go to the Peter P hypothesis. That is, uh, uh, at each promotion, we give a, a different competence because the task is different. And now if you promote the most competent, then you see that uh, uh, the efficiency of your organization decreases rapidly, okay? And this is lower than the, the initial one. So the most competent promotion with the Peter hypothesis doesn't work, it produces damage. Now you promote the less competent and this works because uh, you change uh, an agent from uh, uh, a task uh, which is not very well done and to a level, uh, and then uh, for sure he will uh, do better. But <clears throat> now, if you promote in a random way, let's, let's uh, of course, common sense, less competent, it doesn't work also. But, uh, okay, now, We should change, okay, okay. In a random, you promote a random way 
And in both uh, hypotheses, common sense and Peter hypothesis, uh, random promotion give you also always uh, uh, an advantage to the uh, initial situation. So it's, uh, it's very good. Uh, if you don't know which is your situation, if you are in the Peter hypothesis or in the common sense hypothesis, promoting at random gives you always an advantage and an improvement in the efficiency of your organization. That's the message of, of this work. <clears throat> and this is uh, uh, important because it's very difficult to know which hypothesis are, uh, is the one of your organization. If, you, if people maintain their competence or not, you should do some interview or not. But if you have no time and if you uh, want to improve uh, the efficiency without uh, doing all this, uh, then uh, promoting a random is the best strategy, the best solution. So you may have the Peter Principle problem, but you may solve with random promotion. And this is uh, just synthesized in this slide. You see uh, uh, random promotion or uh, alternate pro uh, promoting the best and the worst gives you always uh, the best solution to this uh, problem. Of course, uh, you, you may have a generalized Peter principle uh, that is not only for hierarchical organization, but anything that works at a certain level will be used progressively in a more challenging applications until it fails. Okay, so not only for hierarchical organization, you may have uh, tools, objects, uh, which may be used efficiently in one situation, but not in another one. For example, I can uh, use uh, very efficiently a hammer to break a glass, but not to demolish a building. Okay, and the same is true for models, theories, ideas. Uh, very often we use the same ideas, the same model by analogy, but this doesn't mean that this is the best uh, solution. And it's sometimes it's much better to start uh, from scratch <clears throat> and maybe in a crazy way. Uh, okay, now a nice story <laughs> about this, uh, because uh, we posted uh, this, uh, this work as a preprint uh, on the archives and, uh, and actually uh, we went on vacation, it was July, uh, and um, to our surprise, uh, this was uh, just uh, re uh, uh, noticed by several blogs. One of these was the technology review by MIT and others who so find this very interesting. Uh, for us, it was just a, a game, and so it was not very, very much serious. I mean, it was not really physics, but okay. Uh, it was fun, and uh, but uh, these people uh, took it very seriously, and uh, so we had this. Then the Democratic Party uh, in the states also noticed it and uh, liked this solution, and um, and also the New York Times, uh, who also reported that year at the end of the year as one of the most interesting. Uh, idea of, of, uh, of, of 2009. And it was uh, already, uh, on, at that time, it was only uh, a preprint. Then we had an editorial by a new scientist, by Mark Buchanan. And, uh, and finally, we published it in uh, February 2010. But uh, in May, we had another surprise that we got an email by Mark Abrams, who is the inventor of the Ig Nobel Prize. I don't know if you know what it is. It is a, a prize which is given to studies that make first laugh and then think. So it's a kind of parody of the Nobel Prize, but uh, not that much. It's sometimes it has some serious aspect. It's a way to um, um, make science popular and uh, notice the, uh, the funny things about science. And uh, at the beginning, of course, we had not proposed our, our paper for this prize. It was just noticed. Uh, we were a bit uncertain about this, uh, but since uh, we, um, we read that uh, very famous physicists had already accepted it, uh, like Michael Berry and uh, Andre Game, that the same year got the, Nobel, the real Nobel Prize, then we accepted it. 
But the nice thing is that uh, we knew this in May <clears throat> and we had to wait silently until September because no one could know about this uh, when we went to Harvard to get this prize. <clears throat> And this is the ceremony. We got the Ig Nobel Prize for management, not for physics, by a physicist, a Nobel Prize winner, which was Frank Witzek, uh, with Sheldon Glashow and Roy Glauber just seated there <laughs> listening to our uh, just uh, talk about the Ig Nobel uh, Prize ceremony. Okay, so this was very funny, and uh, but it gave us also a lot of popularity. Uh, we are this is the group, uh, uh, me and my collaborator with Mark Abrams, who is just the inventor of the of the Ig Nobel Prize. And uh, so this was very popular, <clears throat> uh, and uh, it was uh, <clears throat> because I mean it was broadcasted by uh, live by Google, and so. Uh, it was uh, reported in many journals. And at that point, uh, we were a bit worried <clears throat> because uh, we had studied uh, uh, a very simple uh, model, but uh, we didn't know at that time how much uh, robust was our result. So we started to, to see, to change the, the, the model and to uh, extend it and to see uh, to prove how uh, the robustness uh, of the, our results. And this is the second paper that we published in 2011, <clears throat> where we show actually using modular networks and, and different models that uh, the results are quite robust. Uh, for example, we adopted, we enlarged the number of agents. Uh, we adopted also hierarchical levels uh, of different kinds. Um, <clears throat> using these kind of networks. And uh, you could promote uh, from one level to the other or just following the links. Uh, so different way of promotions also. <clears throat> and uh, we started from um, um, a very efficient and meritocratic initial regime. The time unit was not one year, but one month. and. Uh, and so uh, we call this different way of promotion global mode from one level to the other or a neighbor's mode from one uh, just following the links. And, uh, and this is uh, the result. <clears throat> so the global mode is just uh, similar to the previous one, but from, uh, for a larger uh, number of agents. And you see that uh, even if you uh, give a, a random promotion with a certain percentage, you uh, always get an advantage and an increase in your efficiency, uh, which saturates uh, uh, after some time. <clears throat> uh, and this is true in both ways, in the global mode and in the neighbor's mode, okay? So the results are very robust. And uh, of course, the larger than the number of agents and the less fluctuations you have uh, in, in your uh, evolution. And we focused on the first uh, 20 years of your organization. And you see uh, that there is a, it's not a very big advantage, but it is a certain advantage in, uh, in the efficiency. Okay, but uh, so the results are robust, but uh, are these results so strange and counterintuitive after all? Uh, well, I try to convince you that this is not the case. And, and in fact, uh, uh, we were inspired actually by this uh, paradox, which is the Parondo paradox. I don't know if you ever heard of it. Uh, Parondo is a Spanish physicist who just uh, discovered uh, this paradox. That is in, uh, in two games, in two biased games. Uh, if you uh, play these games uh, with coins uh, separately, uh, you, have, uh, uh, you lose your initial capital. But uh, uh, if you mix uh, and play uh, in a, an alternate way or in a random way, uh, the, two, the two games, uh, you get an increase of your initial uh, capital. You get a winning strategy. So this uh, um, uh, random strategy used for Reparondo uh, paradox was the one that actually inspired us to apply this strategy for the, for the uh, Peter principle, actually. And, uh, and actually, uh, 
just after our uh, paper was published, uh, we realized that other physicists just used, for example, Markov chains, just applied similar strategies, uh, getting similar results. Uh, one of these was Sornet and collaborators in this paper, starting over and Sornet. <clears throat> and so these results are true and are quite robust. After all, natural selection works just this way. You have a random mutation, and if this random mutation gives you an advantage, uh, they are maintained and reinforced and never moved away. Okay, <clears throat> so you have this randomness that uh, uh, is very fundamental for evolution. Uh, but there are further benefits from random selections. Uh, for example, you are, can avoid corruption, nepotism, and uh, in ancient uh, uh, Athens, democracy was born in this way. There were no elections and people participated to the assemblies just uh, uh, through sortition and everyone could participate. But this is another application that I will tell about. Then also uh, nowadays, there are many uh, application of these, these uh, um, X format uh, uh, TV programs where you discover by chance uh, uh, hidden talents. And we have also famous case in uh, history of music like Toscanini and Maria Callas who just started their careers just uh, by chance. Uh, Toscanini was not uh, a director, uh, was just uh, played violin, I think. And uh, Maria Callas just uh, uh, sang uh, different kind of operas and uh, had, she had to substitute one day uh, another singer and uh, she discovered a completely uh, new talent. So, I mean, this is uh, um, very much used among us. So <laughs> I think these are other benefits. Of course, in our study, we did not consider psychological effects uh, and this could have an influence, of course. <clears throat> uh, but the point is that uh, you should, of course, give rewards to a well done job, but not to change the task of the employee. If your employee is very good at the task, you should give promotion, you should give a rewards to maintain that task. Uh, because otherwise you have a double loss. You will lose an excellent employee, uh, who will have probably a poor performance in the new role, and you have to substitute him with a less competent one. So a double loss. <clears throat> Okay, uh, we discovered also that the real companies uh, uh, adopt this, have adopted uh, already this kind of strategy. This is an example in Brazil, this Semco company uh, was transformed by this Ricardo Semler, uh, applying uh, similar strategies uh, with a rotation of jobs and um, also apply some random promotional strategies. And, uh, uh, it was very successful. And now he's a kind of guru, just traveling and writing successful books about these new strategies. But also Google has a similar application. In fact, uh, you probably know that the employees uh, in Google can spend 20% of their working time to develop personal project, then they can propose to the company. So it's a uh, the famous bottom-up strategy that works and that works also in research, as we all know. Uh, this was proposed also to reduce the gender gap uh, and so to have more women uh, in top uh, uh, level uh, jobs. <clears throat> or uh, you may probably know that also in religion, uh, this is adopted. For example, to uh, choose the Coptic Pope in, in Egypt, uh, Christian uh, used lot, and there is a, a child who choose among three possible candidates with similar, of course, uh, ability, similar competence. Then, as you, uh, as I've already mentioned, um, <clears throat> we discovered that uh, uh, random uh, selection of uh, uh, was adopted for uh, uh, democracy at, at the beginning, and uh, so we explored uh, also this application, and uh, we published another paper in 2011 about uh, uh, possible increase of the efficiency of a parliament uh, using uh, adopting. Uh, just a <clears throat> member of the parliament chosen by lot. 
uh, as I was saying, uh, this was the, the, the method that uh, uh, was used in Athens, but uh, continues, uh, continued to be used not only in Athens, but also during the medieval and Renaissance uh, in Italy and other parts of, of the world, Bologna, Parma, Florence, uh, Barcelona, and also Venice adopted similar strategies. In Venice, uh, the, the head of, of the Republic was uh, uh, chosen by a very complicated mixture of election and uh, sortition, just in order to um, mitigate the power of the most, uh, uh, of the richest families, okay? And we know that uh, the Republic of Venice uh, lasted the 500 years until the advent of uh, Napoleon. So, I mean, it worked very well in the past. But then what happened? We had the French Revolution and the people got scared. So uh, uh, this was abandoned, but something remained. For example, in modern juries, in, uh, um, in courts, uh, we have uh, uh, the judge, but we have also a popular jury, uh, which is composed of a common citizen chosen by lot. <clears throat> uh, there were similar uh, proposal in France. We recently have adopted uh, um, just uh, something similar for uh, uh, assemblies of citizens chosen by lot for very hot problems. Uh, similar uh, <clears throat> proposal uh, for uh, the House of Lords in Iceland uh, just uh, uh, the constitution was changed by uh, common citizen chosen by lot and uh, uh, in Ontario, the uh, new electoral law was chosen this way. There was uh, just a uh, uh, common, uh, <clears throat> common citizen elected uh, for an assembly that studied the problem and then the, uh, it was proposed as a, ref as a referendum. Uh, because of course we have uh, conflicts uh, among politicians, professional politicians. Uh, similar experiments were done in California with the deliberative opinion polls. And then we had also a very interesting uh, um, experiment, which was done uh, by Francis Galton. Uh, probably uh, most of you know Francis Galton was a statistician, uh, <clears throat> was a, a cousin of uh, Darwin, and he published in Nature at the beginning of the last century. <clears throat> Uh, a very uh, interesting experiment. During a fair, uh, he chose uh, when he sold some uh, tickets uh, where people had to um, uh, imagine the uh, to guess the, the weight of the uh, of this uh, <clears throat> beast of this uh, ox after it was cut in pieces. Okay. <clears throat> And uh, he got 800 tickets. Uh, and uh, at the end, uh, he just studied uh, the, these guesses. And uh, no one of, of them was completely right. OK, but uh, when he took the average of all these guesses, uh, what he got was uh, uh, the weight, uh, which was uh, within 1%, uh, identical to the, the real weight of the ox. <clears throat> So this was uh, this paper was called Vox Populi and is commonly uh, just uh, um, called Wisdom of Crowds. That means that uh, when people uh, independently can uh, express their opinion and you make an average of this opinion, uh, you can get a very good response, a very good, uh, and this is the basis of democracy, okay? But people should be independent. That's, uh, that's uh, in order to uh, this for, uh, to work. <clears throat> Andrea. Yes. Uh, Vox Populi is the voice of the population. The Yes. Society, right? So, yes, it's uh, uh, in, in, Tur in Turkish, it is how can Sisi. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. So, we imagined also something uh, uh, similar, a random strategy for uh, uh, making the apartment more efficient. And, uh, <clears throat> and we discovered this uh, funny uh, book by an economist, uh, Italian economist. Uh, Cipolla, who suggested uh, just for fun, but it was uh, actually kind of uh, 
very nice uh, book uh, if you uh, find it. Uh, it's about uh, stupidity. Uh, what uh, he, he, he divide people in four uh, categories. You can have you can have people which are intelligent. Uh, that means that uh, uh, can uh, uh, act uh, in a way that uh, they increase the social gain and the personal gain. Uh, you can have bandits uh, in this uh, diagram uh, where people increase. Uh, their gain against, against the social gain. Then you can have naive people that uh, increase the social gain uh, at their expenses. And then you have stupids. This is uh, something that you cannot avoid. <laughs> people who just uh, act uh, decreasing the social gain and also against their interest. Uh, but of course, this was for fun, but uh, we thought that this was interesting in order to devise a model for a parliament. That means that uh, uh, you can imagine to have uh, uh, um, professional politicians that belong to two parties in, in, this, uh, in this diagram, okay, <laughs> within a certain circle, uh, because they agree within a certain circle, circle and their actions are um, uh, act in a similar way. And, uh, but you can uh, also introduce some random uh, legislator, some random members of the parliament, and this uh, should increase the uh, <clears throat> should uh, the efficiency of your uh, of your parliament. In what sense? In the sense that, uh, well, first of all, you have to define what these people can do. They can propose act of the parliament, and they can vote against or in favor of this, of this act. And of course, an act is approved if they have more than 50% of favorable votes. But, <clears throat> and uh, the efficiency is defined in this way, is the product of the percentage of accepted proposal times the average of the social welfare that is ensured, ensured by this proposal. So, <clears throat> uh, what, what this means is that uh, uh, if you don't have uh, uh, members by lot, uh, I mean, uh, the majority party will approve all the uh, acts that, uh, that uh, it, it, it likes, uh, but this is, uh, uh, goes against uh, the, the, the common social gain, okay? But it's very efficient because, uh, I mean, uh, they have a strong majority. Uh, if you have, uh, on the other hand, uh, all the members which are sorted by lot, then it's very difficult to, to put, uh, uh, to find a consensus among all these people. And, uh, and of course you can have very good, very good uh, act of law, but uh, very few of them. So if you multiply these two quantities, you get a maximum. Uh, and this maximum uh, should give you uh, the, the best efficiency of, for your parliament. So a lot of, uh, um, of laws, but good laws, <clears throat> okay? And we have found that this uh, peak, uh, uh, there is a peak actually, uh, as a function of the number of independent legislators, and uh, uh, the number of independent legislators that you need depends on the uh, strength of the majority party. If the majority party and the minority party are very close, uh, you need only a few number of independent legislators, which increases uh, as, uh, uh, the, the majority party increases his uh, uh, percentage, okay? <clears throat> and, uh, but this can be actually uh, expressed with a very simple law that we have found, analytical law that we have found, which uh, is plotted here as a function of the numerical simulation. So there is an optimum that, uh, uh, which we call efficiency golden rule that you can uh, extract out of this model. Okay, also this work had uh, a, a very good uh, uh, popularity and, uh, and actually uh, we presented it also in the Italian parliament, invited by some party. And uh, uh, recently we joined a, a, a new organization uh, which is uh, trying to promote this kind of uh, uh, solutions to improve our democracy. Uh, also, two years ago, we went to another parliament meeting uh, where 
were present also uh, people who really uh, organized already experiments like this in Ireland or in Belgium or in Switzerland. And uh, this is an example in, in Belgium. Uh, Kofi Annan uh, just expressed his positivity about this kind of solutions. And uh, in France, they are applying this uh, to choose a, a solution for uh, the climate change, for example. Um, so, I mean, I think this is something new which could really improve our society. This is the group uh, that uh, worked on, on, this, on this subject. Well, uh, I don't know how much time do I have, uh, Baris. Uh, it's okay. You can go on. Okay, I can go on. So I will. Whenever, I will give, however, you feel like you can proceed. Okay, I will give you some example about financial markets, other application of random strategies, and I will start very very quickly. I will start uh, with this uh, funny experiments that was done by Richard Weisman, which is an English psychologist. Uh, he gave uh, 5,000 pounds to a child, to a finance expert and to an astrologist uh, and uh, that they had to, to bet against uh, the market uh, and to see if they could uh, virtually, of course, uh, increase their initial capital. And uh, what happened is, uh, I think you can imagine that uh, uh, after one week, uh, all, all of them uh, lost something. Uh, the child uh, lost, um, around 5%, the finance expert, 7%, uh, and the astrologist, 10%. But after one year, uh, it was <laughs> completely different. The child, so the random, <laughs> the random choice, uh, got uh, plus 6%. The finance expert lost uh, half of the initial capital, and the astrologist uh, lost just a bit. So this was a fun experiment, but there are real experiments like these uh, that were done, for example, from the Wall Street journals that uh, uh, compare the real uh, investment with, uh, dart, with investment done by darts uh, for almost uh, 13 years. Uh, and uh, you may see here uh, in this uh, abstract uh, of this paper <clears throat> published in Journal of Applied Finance, that darts outperformed the analyst on a nominal and risk adjusted basis during the recent market decline. So random choice in the long run give you uh, much more benefits than, uh, than uh, what uh, you could do just uh, following some deterministic uh, uh, strategies. <clears throat> uh, this is a more recent uh, uh, experiment uh, uh, published in Financial Times and uh, in 2013, <clears throat> where they called them monkeys in this case, but uh, you know, of course are random strategies applied uh, and compared with real um, strategies based on uh, um, common uh, strategies used by experts. Uh, so it means uh, that this really works in the long run. <clears throat> And uh, we published several papers uh, along this direction, also with Dirk Elbing, <clears throat> who is a physicist working in uh, ATH in uh, Zurich. And uh, uh, for example, we uh, compare the random strategies in uh, real um, <clears throat> financial markets behavior. Uh, and uh, what we found uh, is that random strategies are comparable with the deterministic ones. Uh, I don't go into the, the detail of the others, uh, but uh, you may see <clears throat> random strategies is the blue, uh, uh, is uh, comparable uh, for the winds, and, uh, but the standard deviation are much smaller. That means that uh, the risk is, is much less. Uh, and this is true for several uh, index, the, the English one, the FTSE MIB, uh, the, the DAX, the German one, and the, and the Standard & Poor's, the American one. <clears throat> so uh, in the long run, the performance of random strategy is as good as the most used deterministic ones, or even, uh, <laughs> or even better. And in addition, random strategies are costless because, of course, you don't have to invest in studying and, and uh, have much smaller fluctuations. <laughs> Okay, uh, okay, these are other recent uh, 
um, um, just studies uh, in which uh, we, we we found that uh, not only you uh, may uh, just uh, improve uh, your advantages, but you may also uh, avoid dangerous erding related avalanches that can uh, create crashes uh, in uh, in um, in your uh, in your uh, market behavior. So, but let me skip this part because otherwise it will be too long. And I will go to the final part of my talk. Okay, by, by the way, <clears throat> also in this case, uh, we, we got some uh, uh, popularity because uh, this was uh, just uh, um, <clears throat> published by uh, the new scientist uh, and uh, and, uh, and this is the, the group in this case. Uh, we have uh, the economist uh, Alessio Biondo with, with whom uh, we also published the last paper I will talk about and Dirk Elbin on the, on the right. So summarizing, random strategies can be beneficial for the single trader, but also for uh, the, uh, to stabilizing the market. Okay, now the last part, which is about luck. Okay, and uh, this is also uh, <clears throat> an interesting topic uh, where uh, randomness enters. Uh, it is possible to be successful without luck. Uh, are the most successful people also the most talented ones? This is the starting point. And uh, this was uh, the study that was published a few years ago in the Advances of Complex Systems. Okay, in science, you probably know that there is the phenomenon known serendipity that is discovery by chance. And this is, covers almost 90% or even more of the most important uh, discoveries <clears throat> or, because uh, chance is uh, really determinant. And uh, of course, talent is necessary. Uh, uh, you have to be smart enough uh, to discover uh, that uh, um, something which happens by chance as a real value, uh, you have to recognize, recognize and exploit it, of course. But uh, <clears throat> let's see it more in detail what I mean. Uh, for example, a few examples, uh, penicillin. Penicillin was uh, discovered by Alexander Fleming uh, just by chance because he forgot to close a window going on vacation. And when we came, he came back, he found that during his absence uh, for the fact that he left uh, the window open, uh, some of his uh, <clears throat> dishes were contaminated by some spores that was coming from outside, and uh, this killed some bacteria. Uh, after a few years of application of, of these uh, uh, spores, uh, I mean, uh, he, was, he got the Nobel Prize, and uh, we have today penicillin, which is so important. But uh, this is a very nice story and very well known, but uh, there is another one uh, that uh, before Fleming, an Italian studying in Naples, a young student had already discovered, Vincenzo Tiberio, had already discovered the penicillin just by chance in a similar way. And, uh, but he was a, a young student uh, living in Naples. Uh, uh, when he graduated, he published also his result uh, but uh, no one noticed this, and uh, this was completely forgotten. So uh, he was not lucky enough, uh, although he was clever enough to recognize that this was useful. Other examples of, of uh, discovery by chance, you know, uh, Wilson and Pencius discovered the, by chance the, um, this, uh, um, um, cosmic microwave background, just uh, working on this antenna. Uh, and they got also the Nobel Prize for this, <clears throat> but they were not looking for this, that they were doing some other things. Uh, we know very well that uh, uh, WWW was uh, invented for uh, uh, exchanges, uh, just data uh, um, among uh, uh, particle physicists, but nowadays we use it uh, for uh, uh, everything and uh, 
I mean, just uh, uh, an application of something that was uh, thought for a, a completely different use. Uh, Game and Novoselov, again, uh, Andre Game, just discovered graphene, this very interesting uh, material, uh, just uh, playing uh, in crazy experiments during the, the, the weekend uh, with a tape and a pencil. Uh, so, I mean, <clears throat> chance is uh, really important in science and also uh, in, in, for important discovery, but you have to be clever enough, you have to be talented in order to discover a lucky opportunity. Uh, so this is serendipity. Uh, this is a recent study that uh, um, <clears throat> was published in Science by Fortunato and others, uh, and uh, demonstrates that uh, you can publish the, your most popular, most important paper at the beginning of your career, like Franz Wiczek, or uh, in the middle of your career, like Segre, or at the end, when you are retired, like Serge Roche. I mean, the probability for a big discovery uh, are not uh, dependent on, on your age, but most probably on, uh, on the stubbornness, or on, on the... Uh, on the fact that you continue to work uh, until the end. Again, success uh, is often due to chance. For example, the painting La Gioconda that everyone knows, made by Leonardo, why is so famous? I mean, for sure it's not the best painting of Leonardo, but it, it is so famous because it was robbed once uh, at Louvre. And uh, so all the newspapers talked for a long time about this, uh, this painting. And nowadays it's probably the most known and the most famous paintings of Leonardo da Vinci. And if you go to Louvre, uh, not in pandemic times, uh, you may uh, observe scenes like this. <clears throat> uh, other things uh, about the career of artists. Fred Astaire, uh, at the beginning of his career, uh, someone reported that uh, he cannot sing, he cannot act, uh, he's bald, they can dance only a little, but in the end he succeeded. And uh, another success, uh, which, was, which was unexpected, is the, uh, the one by J.K. Rowling. He was very poor at writing uh, this enormous book that no one wanted to publish. And after several um, uh, attempts, uh, finally, by chance, she discovered uh, something that was able to, uh, wanted to publish this book. And this book became just a uh, uh, so well known that is nowadays one of the richest author in uh, not only probably in UK but uh, in the world. And again, Bill Gates. <clears throat> Bill Gates, of course, he must be very clever, very smart, but uh, he studied uh, computer science when only very few people studied computer science. He came from a very rich family. His mother. Uh, knew very well the president of IBM. And uh, when he started to work, he could introduce his PC uh, inside IBM. And this, of course, of course, was a very lucky opportunity for him. So um, this is, uh, is what is said by, by this uh, associate professor of strategy and behavioral science <coughs> during an interview. OK. <clears throat> Again, names are important, but names, of course, are just uh, by chance. Uh, and uh, if your name is easy to pronounce, people will favor you more. There are experimental study on that. And uh, if your name is common, you are most likely to be hired. <clears throat> so again, uh, chance is very important, but also bad chance. You can have an, an, a car accident, a disease, or an heritage. Uh, so this can change completely your life. And so talent is not enough in order to have success. But this was just uh, the starting point. Now let's see. Oh, OK, this is another example. Uh, uh, they found that uh, even if you uh, live uh, in a very safe way, uh, since uh, <clears throat> Uh, you have a DNA replication. Uh, if you live more, this DNA replication is done more and more. 
And uh, so the probability that during this replication, you introduce some error uh, increase. Uh, and so this could uh, cause cancer, for example. So um, a random mistake, which is more probable if you leave more, can be uh, just uh, unavoidable. Uh, so chance is important also in this respect. Uh, then we uh, also found this book, uh, which was written by these economists, uh, Robert Frank, Success and Luck. Uh, and he realized how luck was important uh, when he survived uh, just an accident and a heart attack uh, just by chance, because an ambulance was very close to him uh, instead of starting from the, the closest hospital. And so he survived this, this heart attack. And uh, so, but let's let's uh, uh, produce a simple model which is able to explain all these. <clears throat> and we start from two facts. First of all, we start from the distribution of IQ, which is very well known, and which is a Gaussian. That means that there are no people that are much more intelligent than the average. Okay, because the distribution is very well known to be a Gaussian. So 68% of people are very close to, to the average and only very few, all in detail, you have very few people which are more intelligent by let's say 30%, okay. But notwithstanding this, I mean, uh, uh, we have a great difference in the success, okay. <clears throat> On the other hand, we have also this other fact, uh, which is a very well known one, uh, found by this economist Wilfredo Pareto in uh, 1848, uh, that the distribution of wealth uh, um, in Italy, but not only Italy, all over the world, uh, has a power law distribution. That means that very few people have a lot, uh, and a lot of people have very few. <clears throat> and so this is also called the 80-20. A rule because 20% uh, uh, of the population has 80% of the wealth. Uh, so this is the famous Pareto law. So there are these two effects, but how it is possible that uh, if you have, uh, if a distribution of talent, let's say, uh, as a Gaussian distribution, then uh, the distribution of success, uh, if you, we use for success uh, as a proxy, the richness, for example, uh, uh, is a power law. So we have to uh, put together these two facts. And uh, we tried with this simple uh, model, which we call talent versus luck model. Uh, we imagine a working life period of 40 years and uh, 1,000 agents, uh, which were distributed in a square lattice. Uh, agents have a distribution, have a normal distribution of talent, okay, according to the IQ. <clears throat> And uh, during their life, during their period, the working period, they can encounter lucky events or unlucky events. Um, and uh, we check if they have uh, uh, encountered lucky or unlucky events every six months, okay? They start uh, at the, uh, the beginning with the initial capital of 10 units. Then they can change their capital with these two simple rules. If they encounter a lucky event, then uh, uh, they, double their uh, initial capital with a probability proportional to their talent, okay? <clears throat> uh, so it's not sure, but uh, of course, the, the more talent you are, the, the, the more probability you have to, to increase, uh, uh, to double your initial capital if you encounter a lucky event. On the other hand, you can encounter also an unlucky event, a red one. Uh, a car accident, for example. In this case, you uh, divide by two the, the capital that you have at that time. Okay, so, so it's very simple. You can double uh, in proportion to your talent or you can half your, your capital uh, if you uh, encounter an unlucky event. With, uh, with this very simple uh, dynamics and an agent-based model, well, what uh, these are the uh, agents uh, uh, and the events that uh, uh, move around, okay? <clears throat> In this example, we have uh, uh, 500 agents, okay? But in general, we consider 1,000. <clears> this is the normal uh, distribution uh, 
of uh, um, initial wow talent. Okay, uh, the uh, we put uh, an average of 0.6 and uh, with a um, standard deviation of 0.1. Okay, but this is not important. And then uh, with the net log of this uh, platform uh, for uh, agent based models, so we uh, uh, did these calculations. Well, what we got is the following <clears throat> that uh, this is, for example, um, uh, one realization, okay, that uh, uh, people uh, who uh, got the most of, out of these dynamics. Uh, uh, the most success, the, the, the highest capital, are not, as you may see here in red, the one with the highest uh, talent, okay? And uh, also in the green one, you may see that uh, uh, it's a very similar information that those who get the, the maximum capital are, on, uh, in general, not the most talented one, but uh, have a talent which is uh, very close to the average. These are other plots uh, indicating just the same kind of information. That means that uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, talent uh, is not fundamental in order to, to become the richest one, to, to have a, a great success. And uh, usually those who get uh, the highest success are those who are close to the, uh, to the average as talent, but they had a lot of luck events, okay? Or they were able to exploit a lot of luck events. These are single histories, okay, but uh, I will skip this. <clears throat> oh, first of all, well, this is uh, an interesting result. Uh, uh, using these dynamics, we uh, were able to uh, uh, got the, the famous Pareto law, okay? So the distribution, the final distribution of wealth at the end of the dynamics uh, as a power law with a slope uh, that in this case is minus 1.3. Uh, this is average over 100 runs, so it's, uh, it's not uh, the result uh, of one single event, but it's just a result of many events. And this uh, here below is just uh, the, um, the, the richest uh, agents for each simulation uh, after 100 events. As you may see, uh, this uh, again shows the same kind of information. The most successful individual is one which is moderately gifted agent and only very rarely the most talented one. This is the final distribution after 10,000 runs. Okay, so we have a big problem here, <clears throat> which is this problem. Uh, when we use uh, success as a proxy for talent, uh, we make a mistake. Because we see, oh, those people are the most successful one, the, the richest one. So they may, must be the most talented one. And we give funds, rewards, of, and honors to people which are not the most talented ones, but were simply the luckiest one. So this is an application of very naive meritocracy. Uh, and uh, this is a problem, not only because we are not giving rewards to those who should uh, merit them, but because uh, even for society, if you promote people who are, not the, who are not the most talented one, of course, this is not very good for society, for the entire community, okay? Not only for, from the, the point of view of the single agent. <clears throat> uh, so then we asked ourselves, is it possible to distribute funds? So once uh, you have this dynamics, you lose and you gain, but suppose that you can redistribute funds periodically in order to give another chance, another possibility uh, in order to uh, give a, a possibility to have success also to the most talented agents. Is this possible? Can we uh, do act as uh, uh, in order to uh, stimulate the emergency of the most talented people in order to be successful? Again, because this is good not only for, for these people, but also for society because they can give more to society. Uh, well, it is. <clears throat> uh, we can, uh, uh, for example, <clears throat> uh, adopt uh, uh, this uh, efficiency. So uh, uh, they finalize uh, like the 
increment of talented people, so with a talent greater than 0.7 with respect to the no funding case, uh, normalized to the total given funding. And <clears throat> applying periodically these uh, uh, different strategies to redistribute uh, resources to these agents, uh, then uh, we can promote, uh, according to the, uh, to the uh, different strategies, uh, more or less the most talented ones. For example, <clears throat> if you redistribute one unit to everyone, this is the best strategy periodically, the best strategy to, to produce uh, the emergence of the most talented people. Okay, you have a, a very good increase in, in this quantity. On the other hand, if you give rewards and honors and resources uh, to uh, the people who uh, were the most successful, so to the luckiest one, then uh, you do not promote the most talented one. So and you not re-equilibrate these, uh, these uh, uh, strange dynamics. So again, uh, you can use also random strategies in this case. And uh, uh, after the all equal one unit, uh, if you distribute 10% of, of uh, resources in a random way, this uh, uh, increases very much the efficiency of your system. Um, why we investigate this? Because, uh, for example, for research, this is very important. Uh, how often we see that uh, the groups which receive the, the, the most uh, um, of, of the resources given to research are always the same, okay? Uh, so you forget uh, maybe young people who are very talented, but uh, who uh, of course have no uh, much experience, so they cannot prove that they are, are very good. Uh, and so this is a problem uh, in order to redistribute resources. And uh, <clears throat> so this is uh, just a table, but expresses the same information that uh, I gave you be before. Um, and this is uh, just the same, but uh, with a um, total uh, uh, funding, which is the same for, for everything, for all the strategies. Again, uh, distributing uh, uh, resources in an equal way to everything, to everyone, or uh, in a random way with 50% uh, uh, gives you the, the best strategy to uh, redistribute uh, uh, funds in order to stimulate uh, the emergency of the most talented people. And, uh, and this is very important for research, for example. <clears throat> uh, there are also uh, um, a lot of papers in this direction uh, where people have studied that, uh, for example, uh, researchers who receive the additional funds uh, are not uh, more productive than others who receive less. <clears throat> uh, and uh, so there is this, uh, uh, this problem in research uh, that you continue to, to give prizes and resources to people who just uh, were successful in, in the past, but uh, I mean, uh, they will probably will not be successful in the future and you should better uh, give these results to others. <clears throat> So in, in general, we should en encourage uh, in research diversity uh, and not conformism. because uh, if you give uh, prizes and resources only to the same, uh, what you produce is just that uh, people just continue to, to do research on the same topics, on the same things. But if you want to innovate, if you want to, to do a very good research, you should also try different uh, uh, roads. <clears throat> These are also editorials published in science, science in, in uh, nature, sorry, science benefits from diversity. So we should promote diversity, not only conformism and excellence in the sense promoting always the same groups and the same kind of uh, uh, topics. <clears throat> um, so suggestion of redistributing funds for research uh, has been advanced in several papers and uh, in several institutions has already been applied with success. And um, in conclusion, uh, in general, uh, for this last part, we have presented a very simple model which is able to reproduce uh, 
stylized facts uh, about uh, the role of chance in research and in, uh, in success. And um, very often, if we don't uh, cure this aspect, uh, only um, average talented people get success, uh, but we should uh, act in a different way in order to promote diversity and innovation and just to give a chance also to others. Also crazy ideas. <clears throat> uh, also the study was very successful <laughs> actually uh, by chance, I think, but uh, 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 we studied also most recently a uh, more analytical approach. Uh, uh, th this is the, 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 the paper, sorry, which was downloaded a lot of times. And um, these are the other two collaborators, Plukino and Biondo. <clears throat> and uh, this is the altmetric score for this paper, which was very popular. And uh, this is the page of the project, if you want to know more. We wrote also a book, unfortunately, it is in Italian. And this is a recent paper with uh, Damien Chalet, uh, with whom we tried to uh, an analytical approach to this problem, but it's very hard. It's a very hard problem. Even with a simplified version of this model, it's very difficult to get uh, analytical results. Uh, okay, uh, one last point. Uh, just this is a, a nice analogy. In order to have a very good, uh, very beautiful garden, do you give water only to the most beautiful plants or you give water to everything? I think you know the answer. And this is the, the meaning of, uh, of the message of, of, of this work. <clears throat> and uh, again, uh, this for young people, although luck is important more than we usually think, we usually admit, uh, there are many ways in which we could exploit this uh, chance. Uh, we should open our mind and face uh, a problem for di from different perspectives, uh, travel and talk to people, take the risk also to fail and to the, of the unknown and, uh, <clears throat> and try to adopt also some kind of random strategies or ideas that uh, may, be, may seem crazy at the beginning. Uh, for example, uh, I always like to uh, talk about this example. At the beginning of uh, 1900, I mean, there were very few crazy people that tried to fly with the flying machines. Uh, most of, uh, they, were, they thought they were crazy, but a few decades later, uh, we were on the moon. And uh, this is a, an important message. I mean, uh, we should not be afraid of crazy idea and we should introduce some crazy idea and uh, some strange ideas which are not accepted at the beginning because we, uh, otherwise we do not innovate. We do always the same things and it's difficult to find new ways to solve problems. So once in a while also accept the suggestion of a less expert collaborator and uh, okay. So, um, a bit of randomness is really important. And uh, thank you for your attention and good luck. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, arkadaşlar açabilirsiniz mikrofonu. Uh, Andrea'yı bir alkışlayalım bence. Uh, thank you very much, Andrea. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this, is, this was not only a topic that I loved concerning your works because I admire two of your works, these things, and uh, also your relativity paper. I love them. Uh, but this was also a kind of uh, very nice uh, way of presenting things. I mean, it was a uh, kind of like course to teach how to give a presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs> you're, uh, you're too kind. <laughs> no, no, I mean, believe me. So first of all, um, thank you very much again. I mean, this was a wonderful journey. I mean, I would even call it a journey. So, um, are you ready to have some questions? Sure, sure, sure. I know that you are tired and Catania no, is... No, 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 no. But <laughs> I'm we are, here for you. <laughs> but we are also hungry for science, you see? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, because... Crazy ideas. 
Because at the moment we are really talking about liyakat, meritocracy in Turkey. So, <laughs> uh, okay. First question, uh, Onur Varol. Onur. Hi, hello. Thank you, Thank you very much for the great presentation. Uh, I'm quite fond of like this line of research. So I have one question. Actually, uh, my, my, that might be a comment as well. So when you introduce work by Santo Fortunato uh, in the science, that was, I, I believe, is a review article, but the uh, uh, original science that uh, you presented in the figure, uh, when that claims like su uh, success can come anytime uh, throughout your career, that was uh, belonged to a successful Italian women scientist, uh, Roberto Sinatra. And Roberto did a series of work on uh, science of science. And one of their findings uh, where they introduce a concept of Q factor, uh, they were claiming a success is actually have also some intrinsic prob prob uh, properties, which they uh, measure it with a Q. And then the ideas can come at random from a random distribution. So good scientists can execute a great idea and it might lead a huge success. Or sometimes a great idea might diminish the impact with a uh, not high Q factor scientist. So I, it's a little bit a contradictory when you were saying like a random uh, person might lead to a higher success uh, in the model. And in their science, uh, in their methodology, they say the Q factor is some intrinsic probability. So they suggest a fitness model can explain uh, the scientific uh, fields. Uh, well, it's a different perspective. Actually, uh, the paper you are mentioning was done in collaboration with Laszlo Barabasi and probably Laszlo Barabasi believes more in the kind of a prediction of the success. Um, in the, my perspective, uh, this is a bit um, uh, lower in the sense that, uh, of course, talent uh, is there. Uh, if you are talented, uh, if you are smart, uh, the probability that you get success are higher, but uh, if you look, for example, at the latest uh, papers by uh, Roberta Sinatra, he, uh, she is going just uh, in, uh, in my direction that uh, luck is something unavoidable in the sense that we cannot control everything. Uh, there is, uh, we live in a world uh, together with other millions, millions, of trillions of people. And of course, uh, something happening in, in China influence me after a few days. And, uh, and so everything can happen. I can get uh, uh, COVID and, and die or uh, being ill. And although I'm very talented, I mean, uh, my career uh, is stopped. I mean, that's the point. I mean, uh, we can have some kind of prediction, but it's very, very limited. For example, they also have studied that uh, if you, at the beginning of your career, collaborate, uh, uh, are lucky enough to uh, get a collaboration with uh, a very productive, a famous group, uh, of course, the chances that you uh, are successful are much higher than if you live uh, in, uh, I don't know, in Nepal. Uh, and uh, uh, although you are very talented, I mean, uh, uh, no one knows your work. Uh, so the, the, the point is also a question of opportunities and uh, opportunities uh, are not equal for everyone. Yeah, that's great. And uh, thank you for the answer. I think uh, that's also aligned with the serendipity uh, word like which I really like. May I ask one more question about the first model, about the uh, uh, promotion? Yes, sure. <clears throat> uh, in the promotion model, I was wondering, like, how would it, the result change if it's going to take a top to bottom approach? So the uh, manage, having managers with uh, lack of uh, capabilities is a result of the pro uh, managers who promote those people. So they might not really good at picking who should get promotions. So like uh, reversing the model the other way around, when they are making a promotion decision, it's not that people are getting promoted, the uh, managers choosing the one that are worthy of promotion. So do you think it will change the uh, outcomes if we model it the other way around? So if I understand what you're saying is that uh, it could depend on how the, the, the top managers choose uh, the one who, who, have, who has to promote. 
the, the point is uh, <clears throat> that it's very difficult uh, un unless you know very well your employees. I mean, uh, it's very difficult that uh, for a, a different task, uh, you know already uh, that the, the people who was the best at that level will be the best at the higher level. Maybe it's another one that uh, is not doing very good uh, his, his job. Uh, he doesn't like, I don't know, for he's not, uh, uh, he has not the attitude for that uh, task. And if you move it to another task, uh, it can do very well. Uh, but this, of course, uh, um, implies that you know very well your employees. If you, of course, if you are in this position, of course, you can, uh, uh, there is no, no, um, uh, no need uh, to, to choose a random. But if you don't know that, then choosing a random could allow you to discover uh, new talents. Okay, uh, maybe you can try and then uh, uh, rotate jobs and uh, things like that. Uh, but again, uh, the point is that the one of the, the flying machines in uh, 1900, I mean, no one believed in that. And uh, the, the lucky, uh, the, the right uh, brothers uh, constructed bicycles at that time, but they were visionaries, they, they believed uh, in, in their project. Uh, and after a few decades, uh, they could fly and uh, now we are on the moon. I mean, the point is that uh, you should give a, a chance uh, to also crazy ideas uh, because this is the only way to innovate. Maybe only one of 10, one of thousand will work. But if you don't allow for this, uh, it's very difficult that uh, you could solve, you can go ahead and uh, innovate. That's, that's the thank point. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, Sena Atle has a question. Yes, um, thank you for the presentation, firstly. I, I would like to ask, um, choosing a random strategy is uh, not itself a random strategy. How can we decide uh, what, uh, um, in which situation we should choose a random strategy and um, then we shouldn't choose a random strategy. For example, um, studying and like uh, working for improving ourselves is a good strategy, I think. But um, if we decide that is also a random, uh, that should be also a random choice, how can we uh, know that we will succeed? There is no, <laughs> you are not sure, of course. But if you do not allow for uh, new opportunities, uh, I mean, the message is that uh, it's not that because luck is important uh, that you should uh, stay in your room closed uh, and uh, waiting for the uh, event that uh, could uh, uh, allow you uh, success. You have to look for it, of course. You have to go out. So you have to uh, work in uh, outside your field. Uh, listen to other uh, points of view, because only in this way, uh, I mean, you could uh, see the problem from, from different perspectives. You could, you could see different ways to, to go ahead. <clears throat> like in the Monte Carlo uh, method, I mean, you uh, of course accept moves that uh, give you a, a, a lowering energy, but you should accept with a certain probability also moves that uh, uh, allow you an increase in energy because uh, beyond that ill of, of your uh, um, landscape, there could be uh, a deeper minimum. Uh, that's, that, that's the point. I mean, uh, <clears throat> now and then uh, you, you should, of course, not always, but you should give a, a certain percentage to, 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 to chance. Uh, and sometimes it just, uh, um, uh, there is also another thing that is very well famous. Uh, the, um, I mean, it's referred to a, a big uh, bee. Uh, the big bee uh, is too big to, to fly, but he doesn't know and he can fly. So, so it, the point is that very often we have prejudice. Uh, we have studied that this cannot be possible uh, like flying machines. And uh, so we don't go in that direction. But there are people who believe that this could be done and, uh, and maybe they, they succeed. I mean, it's, it's not sure, but you can give an opportunity to, to, 
to new things, also crazy ones. Um, okay, so um, I, I don't know if that, I answered to your questions, but yeah, uh, yeah, I, I get it. Okay, I, I would like to ask uh, something more about the first model. Um, so when we said that uh, the higher we go up to the hierarchy, where uh, the uh, talents or like uh, necessary skills are different for every position, is that right? Yes, yes, of course. So uh, the hier hierarchy itself is not really a hierarchy of talent and success, but um, mostly maybe we, uh, the top, uh, the person in the top of the hierarchy is the one deciding uh, the future of the ones that No, no, that no. Are... no, no, it's not in that sense. For example, took a doctor. Uh, in an hospital, you have a, a doctor who is a, a, a very, an excellent surgeon, okay? The best one that you have. Of course, maybe he wants to be paid more, he wants to, to have a, a more powerful position and uh, maybe he applies to be the director of that hospital. Uh, which is something that, uh, of course, uh, if you want to proceed in your career, is something that you should accept. But if you promote him to be the, the director, the administrator of the hospital, most probably uh, he will not be so, so good at being an administrator, and, but it was an excellent sergeant. And in that case, you will lose an excellent sergeant, you will get a, a mediocre administrator, and yet to substitute him as a sergeant with another one, we will probably not be as good as him. So that's the point. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Serhat uh, Kadoğlu. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Serhat Kadolu, please. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Serhat, duyabiliyoruz. You can choose random people as a uh, millet wiki, like uh, I didn't, as like as senators. And the thing is, uh, there is this uh, example, uh, a jury had failed so drastically, the OJ Simpson case. So if you, the choosing random people does not necessarily mean that they are not uh, susceptible to lies or manipulation. So, uh... sure, sure. No, you're right, you're right. But in fact, for example, if you look at the experiment done by Dalton, uh, Galton, sorry, uh, the, that phenomenon works only if people are independent. I mean, if you uh, are manipulated or if you are influenced too much by others, then that, that, this, uh, that uh, doesn't work. So uh, the wisdom of crowd works only if people can judge uh, independently. <clears throat> and uh, making an average over all these opinions, for sure you get uh, the best uh, uh, result. This can be done for, uh, the, if you look on the web, uh, there are many experiments uh, of these kinds, and uh, which of course fails if people are influenced. So you should, in some sense, preserve the independence of people, which is uh, difficult, of course, but with anonymous, uh, for example, if uh, uh, the other people don't know who will be the other uh, component of the jury or uh, of the, <clears throat> or if the people are, are chosen only to approve the one law and then they go away, then I think that this could be implemented uh, with success. Okay. And Andrea, I have a question. Yes. Uh, now in Turkey right now, uh, we are really uh, arguing about meritocracy, like liyakat in Turkish. So mm -hmm. uh, in our case, it's the lack of meritocracy that is under debate in uh, politics and government offices and everywhere. So uh, if I uh, go with your reasoning, 
so this means that Turkish government is doing the best uh, by almost going through random choices instead of liyakat meritocracy. I mean, is it is it how I should understand? Like, if you would be an advisor uh, to the Turkish uh, president, well, what what would you say? I mean, in that sense, really. I mean, uh, this is really hot topic right now in Turkey. So, what would you recommend? Like. Not in parliament wise, but like uh, how to build a government, like space agencies, research institutes, and such, or economy. Like, uh, would you go random all the way? So the point, the point is, is this one. Of course, you need experts. <clears throat> you need experts because, uh, uh, I mean, uh, but even politicians are not experts. I mean, politician by profession. Uh, are people who uh, should represent uh, you because you voted them. But then when it, they have to decide on uh, very specialized items on which is the best strategy for research or for economy, or, of course they, um, uh, they consult experts. But uh, the point is that uh, uh, very often their vision is limited. Uh, I make you an example. Uh, if you have a problem in your house, I mean, uh, a problem of health, uh, someone uh, needs some uh, uh, operation or uh, you need to repair something, of course, you consult the experts, very often more than one. But at, at the end, uh, it's you who choose uh, or your family who choose the best solution. So the point is just, uh, like politicians always do, but the, they are very often um, constrained by uh, interests which are different from the interests of population. And th that's why if you introduce, uh, do not substitute completely uh, politician by profession, but if you introduce a, a portion of members of the parliament, or if you introduce this citizen assembly in order to discuss, uh, in an informed way, uh, the uh, solution, uh, the best solution uh, in order to climate change, for example, or the best economy or uh, strategies for research and things like that, I think that uh, uh, you will find better solutions because they are more influenced by personal conflicts, by personal interest. Mm. And it, you see, you make an average over a larger uh, um, number of people with different interests, with different culture, with different backgrounds. Mm. Okay. I don't know if I have answered your uh, yes, yes, yes. question. So <clears throat> diversity also matters in that regard, right? Yes, yes, of course, diversity. Because so, then when you take the average, I mean, it's, uh, it's better modulated. Because you see, usually politicians, uh, when they go, when they play for the top, they are always surrounded by the same group of people. Yeah, but there are a lot of interest, uh, economical interest, personal interest. If you take a normal common uh, citizens, they have no interest. Uh, uh, only those of, of their children and uh, their nephews and uh, a better future for this planet. That, that's the point. So it's like uh, it was a child who said that emperor is naked. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank but you. you know why very often a child surprises us because they they look at things in a different way with no prejudice, and very often they are right. Yeah, they, that's true. Any other questions? Başka soru sormak ister. Başka soru sormak ister. Any other questions? I guess that's all. Uh, once again, uh, thank you very much. Uh, just a moment. Uh, Asta Tuncer, uh, soru sormak mı istiyorsunuz? Evet, evet hocam. Ha, buyurun, buyurun. Uh, thank you for this presentation, first of all. So my question is that, uh, is there any critical number of repeating the action or uh, is there any critical time for the system uh, or any universal class? And uh, for, for what model, for, for, for the last model? 
Sorry? For the last model, this talent uh, versus luck? Yes. Um, we have not um, investigated this, actually. Of course, uh, the slope uh, depends very much on the dynamics. So if you change uh, the, for example, the initial conditions so, or uh, change the uh, slightly the dynamics, uh, you can get uh, uh, different slopes. Uh, so in, in this sense, for sure, there are different possibilities, but uh, uh, this is the simplest model, uh, which you can complicate it, uh, of course. So most probably there are uh, different classes, but we have not investigated that. Uh, the, another question, uh, shortly. Uh, uh, can we determine the chance uh, as uh, looking to the network topology? Or, uh, for example, uh, can we take the chance as an interaction between the nodes in a graph, for example? Or uh, um, well, what is the in, in number this, of... In this model, we didn't use networks. Uh, but of course, uh, in principle, uh, you should take into account also the topology. Um, for example, we, what we want to study is uh, not only success for single persons, but uh, success, for example, for a group of persons, for a group of research. Mm -hmm. I mean, how can you uh, quantify this for a group of research? And uh, for example, we have also studied diversity, uh, interdisciplinarity, and we have seen in a different paper, which uh, I didn't quote, that uh, uh, usually interdisciplinary groups uh, 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 are more have more success than people uh, working all only in uh, in, uh, in one topic uh, because they can take uh, inspiration from different uh, um, backgrounds. Uh, so this is another important message. I mean, uh, just try to mix things in order to find new things. I mean, if you work only <laughs> from the same perspective, uh, it's very difficult that you find new things. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Olur has a question. Uh, thank you very much for uh, this nice uh, presentation. Uh, I have a different question, actually. Do you think, is there any place for quantum randoms in social models? For quantum? Quantum randomness. Yes, uh, oh. not the quantum theory, but the uh, uh, pro uh, quantum probability theory. Do you think can we approach social problems uh, using quantum probability theory? Well, I, I don't know, actually. But uh, what I, I showed is that you don't need quantum mechanics to, to introduce some kind of chance <laughs> in the dynamics. Even at the classical level, you have a, a lot of uh, um, randomness which uh, we do not control i mean uh, so i mean uh, although as a scientist we want to predict things but already with uh, chaos with chaos theory we know that uh, since uh, we don't know so in detail the initial conditions we are able to predict up to a certain point and uh, and not only that if you consider that uh, you work in an environment with many others, I mean, you cannot control everything. Uh, and so your, your life, your career, everything depends also on what the others do. Uh, and so, yes, it, uh, you, you need to be, uh, to continue to work, uh, to, to be stubborn, to be open, but this is not enough in order to succeed and uh, to be famous, to be rich. Of course, I know this is not uh, what everyone wants, but uh, this is just to understand that uh, um, our life, uh, uh, we are, uh, we can do a lot according to our actions, but uh, this is not enough. I mean, uh, more, although it's difficult to admit, but uh, I mean, uh, we depend also on the other actions. Uh, uh, pandemics is just an example of that. I mean, <laughs> it's not enough that you, you uh, I mean, uh, you, you put your, your mask and everything. It depends also what the others do. Uh, can I uh, reformulate my question uh, yes. uh, after your explanation? Uh, actually, social beings uh, behave in a, a contextual way. Uh, for example, uh, the probability for me to do something uh, 
it depends on the people around me. Uh, for with different people, uh, I can act in a diff diff different way. Uh, and I, I think uh, a quantum mechanics is contextual in a, a similar way uh, by uh, meaning quantum probable th theory actually uh, I want to uh, ask this uh, contextuality. Can we uh, model the contextuality of uh, social uh, uh, networks by using quantum probability theory? Well, th this I don't know actually. I don't know if this is possible technically, but again, I think that uh, maybe you can do better. I don't know. Maybe there is quantum entanglement also among people. So, <laughs> people, <laughs> it could be. Uh, maybe we will discover it. But uh, for sure, we are more connected than we think of. I mean, uh, uh, there are many things that we still don't know. Uh, but um, okay, uh, long range connection, even classical uh, ones, are, are already present in our world. Uh, even if uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, could improve it or not. Uh, this I don't know how to answer really. You can try. Thank you very much. And Andrea, I know that you feel tired, but I have one quick question. Okay. How do you, how do you see the future of social physics? Well, I think it's going well. Uh, of course, it's, it's difficult because uh, <clears throat> uh, with respect to physics, uh, uh, people uh, react and uh, and uh, and also so it's a, a particle do not have a feedback and, uh, and so this is different with people and and also it's difficult also to do experiments and uh, because uh, if um, people are informed that they they behave in a different way uh, so it's um, uh, it's a different field it's uh, very challenging. Uh, but I think that, uh, like uh, in uh, in many situations, uh, you cannot predict the uh, the motion of of a, of a particle in a gas, but you can predict the behavior of a gas. And in some sense, uh, this predictability is possible with uh, in social science. But uh, but still, uh, there is uh, also this. Uh, 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 fact that uh, chance uh, is continues to be important, and uh, the fact that people react to to the models that you propose, so it's very difficult to um, to have good solutions. So it's uh, in a, in a way. I don't know if I answered the, to your yeah. questions. Yeah, thank, thank you very much once again. Uh, we took a lot of your uh, time. Uh, no, no. It's okay, uh, it was a pleasure. Th thank you once again. I mean, this was wonderful. Thank you very much. I, 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 I much. learned a lot and I was able to think uh, in a profound way. I hope it was uh, stimulating enough. Uh, that's, it, uh, that's, I if mean, I to, succeeded to me, in that, I'm happy. To me, it was more than that. I mean, I, I, I believe that because you see, you explain a lot of things, in fact, counterintuitive, because you see, in the times, in, the, in 1920s, 25s, during Einstein, Heisenberg, everybody thought that you should do your best work in physics at the age of 25, 26, 27. Yes, yes. So- uh, You have a chance, you have a chance until you are yeah, old. So, so <laughs> for, for, for old people like me, it gives uh, inspiration, so. But you have to insist, you have to insist until the end. Yes, uh, <laughs> th th thank you very much. I mean, this was- Thank you, uh, thank I mean, you a lot. Your slides are, were excellent. I am just sorry for Poverino Tiberio. <laughs> 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 so uh, I thank everybody for participating uh, until the uh, question sessions. We were 42 people. Uh, and then when the question session, question and answers QA session started, we dropped to 22. Uh, but on average, we had 42 participants who went all the way to the end of the talk. Uh, it was very interesting and nobody wanted to leave until the end uh, because usually we start good and until the end, uh, towards the end, people are lost. So um, 
I guess this is because of the um, uh, the quality of the talk and presentation. Uh, thank you. Thank you very uh, thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, you. Andrea. Uh, and have a good day to everybody and uh, be healthy and safe and sound. And, That's uh, the most important thing. And, and strive, uh, as Andrea said, insist. Insist. <laughs> <laughs> okay. thank, thank you. Thank you. Never give up. Never give up. <laughs> thank, thank, thank.